By the time the Challenger crew arrived in Florida, they were already behind schedule. The previous shuttle had been delayed a record six times, and with 12 launches planned for the coming year, NASA was keen to see Challenger go. On the eve of the launch, Krista's parents, Grace and Ed Corrigan, were invited to join the seven astronauts and their families for the traditional farewell party. In order to go to the beach house, you had to make sure that, uh, the doctors had to make sure that you didn't have a cold or were coming down with something, and so we had to have a doctor's examination. And uh, the next morning, a car came and picked us up and took us down to the beach house, and then uh, a van came in with all the crew, the 51-hour crew, and so we had a couple of hours together, had lunch there. Krista had said to us, she was looking forward to it very much. She wasn't apprehensive at all about liftoff, but uh, I think it was just maybe a little more sobering and there it became to the time of going. When we were leaving, we were walking down the steps to get into the car and kiss Chris goodbye, and I said, oh, have a wonderful trip and all that, you know, and uh, Ed kissed her goodbye, and then she kind of pulled him back, and she kissed him again, and when he came down, he was kind of thoughtful, and he said, it's almost as if she didn't want me to go, <laughs> and that was the last time we saw her. With less than 24 hours to go before liftoff, the launch control team began to work through the four thick volumes of procedures to activate Challenger's flight systems. I'm always nervous. Uh, the last nine minutes of the countdown, I'm always nervous. My hands are shaking, my heart's beating real fast. Um, not that I expect anything to go wrong, but just because there's so many things that could go wrong. At the same time, the mission management team was getting the latest weather forecast from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. The weather situation was undergoing a lot of change. We expected a uh, cold front to actually sweep through the uh, Cape area on, um, which would have been then Sunday morning, and we expected it to bring in cloudiness, uh, showers, and possibly even thunderstorms. Within the hour, they needed to decide whether to start tanking the vehicle with half a million gallons of unstable fuel or to delay the launch. As they debated the options, Grace Corrigan enjoyed a privileged night viewing. It was very beautiful. You pulled up and you were able to get out of the van and the shuttle was off in lights and it was it was really quite beautiful it was very cold very cold but uh, it was a lovely sight it was kind of unreal it was you know the feeling you looked up there and it was a, almost like a, a fairyland you know to see all these twinkling lights and that and then to think that this object was going to be up in orbit you know it was it was a little unreal but while Grace was at the launch pad, the mission management team had decided to delay takeoff until Monday morning because of the forecast bad weather. As the sun rose on a beautiful Sunday morning, it was clear that the weather station had got it badly wrong. We had been told on Saturday evening by the weather folks uh, that we'd have a, a lot of wind and some rain a front moving through, and uh, we met and we decided that we would not launch on Sunday, that we would wait, and Sunday was a beautiful day. We missed an opportunity to launch. By early evening, the launch control team assembled once again this time hoping for a clear run. At 1.30 a.m., the firing room gave the go-ahead to begin tanking, an expensive process and therefore a serious commitment. Uh, we 
make a decision to tank that big tank and to fill it with oxygen and hydrogen, mostly based on the weather. If we feel like we've got a good chance to launch the next day, uh, and tanking starts about nine hours before launch, we go ahead. By early morning, everything was ready for the final countdown. The crew were told to prepare for departure, while close tabs were kept on the changing weather. Of course, I went home uh, after the regular duty day on Sunday and came back for the launch attempt on Monday. Again, I was monitoring the uh, radar. But the day started out relatively good. If I recall, we had scattered or broken clouds, but the clouds did get thicker. With strong crosswinds predicted for early afternoon, there was growing pressure to launch. At 7 a.m., the crew were ready for the ritual walkout. Uh, the crew walkout is, is something that's uh, kind of tradition. This, this is the last opportunity for the world, for the news media, for the friends, families to, to see them and, and say hi. Now, you can't touch them or shake hands or anything because they're in quarantine, but you can uh, actually get probably as close as I am to you as they walk by for, for a fleeting couple of seconds, and then they go into the vehicle and off to the pad. At pad 39B, the crew took the elevator to level 195. They were to be the first astronauts to launch from this site since the glory days of the Apollo missions, 15 years before. Waiting for them behind the swing doors were the closeout crew, the last people they'd see before leaving Earth. CPR, this is LTD on air to bow one. I reach a five by, how me? All clear, good morning. Good morning, sir. While each astronaut was secured for takeoff, Pilot Mike Smith and Commander Dick Scobie proceeded to activate the shuttle's systems. At that point, the closeout crew went through the formality of securing the cabin. But the hatch door wouldn't close properly. There was a problem with the locking screws. Okay, uh, we got a problem on removing one of the screws on the milk stool. It appears it might have to be drilled out. Uh, OVCC, you're saying you cannot remove it. That is correct. Yeah, been working now for 40 minutes on it. Monstruct OTC, copy. Okay, do we have the proper tools up there to do that job? OVCC. That's a negative. I do not have the drill. Because it's a, a hazardous environment up there in the white room uh, with the potential of hydrogen vapors, uh, they wanted to use a battery drill rather than a power drill. So a battery drill was rushed up to them uh, it was flat, the battery was flat, it wouldn't, wouldn't work anymore. Nine more batteries were sent for three miles to the pad, but none of them worked. We had some problems with the hatch and a lot of conversation between the mechanisms engineer that's responsible for the hatch and the flight crew and myself. And unfortunately, the equipment that we sent out didn't work properly and we could not resolve the hatch issue. Finally, they used a hacksaw to cut the bolt off and the door was sealed. But the whole process had taken over three hours, long enough for strong crosswinds to build. Office director to challenge you. Yeah, Dick and Mike, uh, we're looking at some crosswinds out the runway right now that don't look uh, favorable at all. Uh, we have just had a uh, announcement from uh, launch director Gene Thomas uh, to the crew and to the launch team that we are going to scrub for today. We were kind of geared for it, but that's a shame. And I feel badly <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> I knew from Krista describing it and all that it was a very uncomfortable situation because they're laying on their back and kind of like that, and they can't really do anything. And to think that they had gone this hour or almost two hours or something laying in this position and because 